professor of biology and medicine and medical science in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Brown University. Um, she studies vertebrate morphology, biomechanics, physiology, and evolution, and she uses biomedical uh, imaging to do that. She has many uh, peer-reviewed papers in high-impact journals, and uh, she's a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, president of the Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology, and past president of the International Society for Vertebrate Morphologists. So, on a personal note, I did my PhD with uh, Sherry Crisco at Brown, and we worked with um, Beth as she was building the x-ray system. And she was, um, it really sort of changed the path of my career. And then when I moved on to Queen, she was extremely helpful in helping me get set up with my lab and um, has sort of, I think, fostered a really collegial environment among the, uh, those of us that work on um, biplanar x-ray. So, and she's also a fantastic scientist, which you'll see in about a second. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, and thanks also, Jillian Beveridge, for the two of you convincing me to come to this meeting. Um, it's been really wonderful, and in particular, because it's coincided with the founding of the ISB Working Group in Comparative Neuromuscular Biomechanics. Um, and the, the goal of this group is to foster interactions between biomechanists who study animal systems and uh, orthopedic human biomechanics research. And that's a, a wonderful goal and one that I've really enjoyed. Uh, I think we have a lot to offer each other, the two communities, the zoologists and the human biologists. And so thanks to the founding board of this group that have been putting it all together. And um, as the current president of the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology, I look forward to working with this working group to um, really continue to foster these, these connections between human and zoological biomechanics. So we have a division of comparative biomechanics within SIGBE that, um, that is largely animal biomechanics, and we'd love to get more human biomechanics. So onto the topic of the day, uh, biplanar video radiography combining with 3D mesh bone models. Um, this is an idea that I just realized from looking back, looking at the literature, is nearly 25 years old, which is pretty amazing, right? Um, Tashman and Banks as early um, people uh, working on this in the human biomechanics field. And then my colleague uh, Steve Gatesy at Brown University, um, in parallel, without actually us knowing it, was thinking about these issues um, and trying to do similar kinds of techniques with animal biomechanics starting in the 90s. Um, so the basic idea is to take uh, bone shape data from a CT or MRI, make a mesh model, get all the static bone shape data, and then do biplanar video fluoroscopy, video radiography to get the motion data, and then animate those bones to match exactly what that subject did, the bones of that subject to match exactly. So you end up with 3D bones moving in 3D space with high precision and accuracy for what that motion was. So it's really like having x-ray vision. You can see the bones moving. It goes by various names, model-based motion analysis, dynamic RSA. We've been calling it X-ROM, X-ray reconstruction of moving morphology. I don't care what people call it. It's, you know, it's, it's a name, whatever. Um, and uh, so in terms of hardware, we started off um, putting together a system with these mobile C-arm fluoroscopes. Um, and we had help from Ryan Reeser at Radiological Imaging services, um, that's my colleague Steve Casey, um, sort of puzzling about the intersection of the two x-ray beams. You can see there some, um, some, let's see if I can fix it up. Okay, I won't think that. But you can see some duct tape and some string, the central pieces of, of all the research labs, um, trying to look at the, the intersection of the beam. So this is a small system um, that's particularly great for zoological research and relatively inexpensive, about 200,000 US dollars. And then we um, had funding from the Keck Foundation to build a larger system, and we worked with Marty Coolis to design this system. And 
I've been keeping track of systems worldwide, and um, quite a number of labs have, have adopted the, these technologies that we, we helped develop. Um, and overall, there are over 40 labs now worldwide with uh, biplanar um, video fluoroscopy for motion analysis studies. And it's interesting, it's not an equal mix between uh, labs that are doing zoological, animal biomechanics, and human orthopedic biomechanics. Um, and so you can see the, the numbers added each year are kind of steady, but it adds up over time. Um, since we're scientists, and if you want to look at the data, get out your Q, <laughs> QR reader. I'm going to go ahead one more slide, but it has the QR code on it. Um, so I've developed this. Um, spreadsheet just in, in uh, Google Sheets that anybody who has the link can edit it. Um, and if you have a system, check and see if it's here. Check if the specs that I have are right. Correct it. It's ed editable by anybody with the link. And so that's where the data are. Um, and it's exciting to see these systems come together over the years. And what you'll see um, over in this column on the your right um, is that some systems are specialized for human orthopedic research, some for zoological comparative research, and some for both. Some do both. So in our work on animals, we, um, we tend to implant markers because we can, and that's a wonderful thing. It makes the workflow faster. So here you see a turtle with, with uh, 0.8 millimeter tantalum beads embedded in the shell and the hind limb there. Um, and we've developed software to do the distortion correction, the calibration, and tracking these markers automatically. So um, this, this uh, XMA lab software is free for anyone who's developed with NSF funding um, and is available on Bitbucket. And so that's really accelerated our ability to look at different species. Um, so I gave a, a talk at ASB and a keynote address a couple years ago, and I talked a lot about our fish work, so I won't talk about that anymore. But we now we're up to nine species of fish that we've studied, um, largely feeding, but also some locomotion, as in that large that uh, striped bass. Um, lots of reptiles, amphibians and reptiles, frogs, salamanders, um, turtles, a bunch of lizards, snakes. Um, crocodiles, alligators, and then a whole bunch of birds. And these are a mix of locomotor feeding and also uh, lung ventilation studies, rib kinematics. So um, we're really building up the animal diversity. And then in terms of mammals, there's also a mix of locomotor and uh, feeding studies, quite a lot of feeding studies that I'll talk about some more. But first of all, um, turtles. Turtles are a great uh, subject for any kind of x-ray study because you can't see what's happening inside the shell, right? We want to see how's the shoulder girdle and pelvis moving inside the shell, um, and you just can't see it without x-ray. And so they, they look gorgeous in the, in the biplanar fluoroscopy. Um, lovely, lovely animals, the prettiest x-rays I have. And so I'll talk a little bit about some, about some of the forelimb work. Um, so here we have the uh, scapula coracoid and the humerus anime this uh, pond turtle, river pooter turtle, um, and this is walking. And what you'll see is that shoulder girdle is rotating a lot. So especially you'll see in this dorsal view, you can see that that, that uh, scapula coracoid is really rotating a lot. And what that's doing is increasing the stride length. So turtles are constrained. They can't bend their spine the way lizards do. So when lizards are locomoting, they bend their spine to increase their stride length. Um, but turtles can't do that, so instead they rotate the scapula the same as similar to mammals um, to really increase the stride length. And so we found um, on your left there, the dark blue is retracted and the light blue is protracted. We found a range of over 35 degrees of shoulder rotation, um, the girdle rotation, and that increases the stride length in, in walking and swimming by more than um, 30%. The pelvis also moves, and you can see the pelvis there. Uh, but it moves much less, and so it doesn't contribute as much to stride length. And so um, we thought, well, okay, these are you know these are pond turtles that um, uh, you know, they walk and they swim. But what about um, what about sea turtles? So we had the opportunity to study these juvenile sea turtles with my colleague Jeanette Weinigan from um, uh, Florida, from Florida. And so here it is in a, the, one of the small sea turtles in a trackway in the X-ray machine. And um, we thought, well, so these animals are so forelimb dominant, right? They do this, this swimming stroke. Um, we thought maybe there'd be even more girdle motion to enhance that, that stroke. And uh, so we, um, we animated the shell, 
the scapular coracoid, the humerus, and then just the, the external fin to be able to see the motion. Um, and you'll see here with the shell held still, that there's actually relatively little girdle motion. There's relatively little scapular coracoid motion. Um, it looks like there are big spaces in there because they, these are juveniles. They have a whole lot of cartilage in their joints, which is interesting too. Um, you can see tremendous uh, pronation and supination that's a lot driven by the humerus. And so the elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, and long axis rotation of that humerus is all driven by muscles that are attached to that girdle. And so we think the girdle isn't moving much because it's providing a steady base for those muscles for this flapping motion. So um, this, is, this is fun. Um, it's pretty much all skeletal kinematics. It's great because we can't see inside the animal otherwise, so this gives us the skeletal kinematics. But I don't think this is the real power of this model-based motion analysis. I think the real power is when you are really using the shape of the elements as well as the motion simultaneously. So I think the most powerful applications are um, take advantage of having precise bone shape and motion together, or I should say skeletal shape, um, whether it be cartilage or, or bone. And so just a very recent example on um, uh, joint biomechanics, contact surfaces, cartilage contact surfaces in the knee, um, having that shape along with the motion gives a distance map to understand the function of the joint. One of the things I've been working on quite a bit um, is mastication in mammals. I thought it'd be fun to talk about that here because there's a little different from locomotion. So mammals, we have precise occlusion of our teeth. Our teeth have to fit together just right when we're chewing. And, um, and so in order to understand chewing, you really need to have the shapes of the teeth and the motion together to understand mastication. And there are quite a number of labs that are taking advantage of this now. So here are some of the PIs and their institutions and some of the animals that we're working on. And actually, pigs were one of the first animals we studied. People who've been following this for years have seen all of our pig data for, for years and years. So and they, we started with them because we were sure that they would eat in the small x-ray volume, right? They're pigs. You put the food there, they're going to eat there. Um, and so yeah, it was a good, it was a good choice for, for a place to start. So we collected the biplanar fluoroscopy. With the, those are our smaller CRM fluoroscopes. This is real speed in lab uh, frame of reference. So you can see they chew pretty fast at three or four hertz. Here it is in, in cranium frame of reference. So you can really see the jaw motions. And as it turns to face you, I want you to see the way that the jaw is yawing back and forth to produce the grinding stroke. So in these animals, the, the jaw is a single unit fused mandibular symphysis, and it yaws back and forth to produce the grinding motion. And so because we have the tooth morphology um, and the motion, we can track the way the cusps of the teeth are interacting. So what we've done with this red and blue dot is put uh, virtual landmarks on the, tooth, the lower tooth cusps, and then we look at how those project onto the upper tooth cusps. So we can see here, um, in the red and the blue, the way that those cusps are moving when the jaw is doing that overall yaw motion. And so we humans do this kind of chewing with the yaw, with a fused lower jaw, and so do pigs. Most recently, um, we started studying a marsupial mammal. Um, some might say a more primitive mammal. Um, they, uh, you can see here this uh, short-tailed opossum is a fairly small opossum. Um, they no, have pouch fine. young, their, their babies uh, are born quite um, immature and develop outside the mother. Um, and we chose them because they have an ancestral tooth shape. So looking in the fossil record, we can see that these opossums retain an ancestral tooth shape called a tribosphenic molar. They have an unfused mandibular symphysis, which means the two halves of the lower jaw are loosely connected, and particularly the lower jaw can rotate two halves, the hemi mandibles, can rotate about their long axes. Um, and that can help with occlusion, is the thought. Um, so this has never been tested before, but the thought, the hypothesis going in is that because the, the hemi mandibles can rotate, as the teeth come together, the animal has some control about how precisely the teeth are coming together. So that long axis rotation of the hemi mandibles is thought to be important for uh, the evolution of precise tooth occlusion. 
So here's our XROM animation of the opossum. Not too remarkable from lateral view. So what we did with, the, with those uh, colored strings are there is we just mapped onto it the attachment points of um, sort of muscle tendon unit fascicles. So just a straight line, not a, not a fancy musculoskeletal model wrapping, um, not measuring fascicle length directly because there are tendons in there, but just to get a general idea of how these muscle tendon fascicles are changing length uh, with, the, um, with the jaw opening and closing. If we really wanted to know what was happening with the muscle fascicles, we need to put some little metal beads into the muscles themselves. Um, we call that fluoromicrometry. So if we had a couple of um, metal beads, tiny beads, in the muscle itself, we could measure the fascicle length changes, and then we could also measure the end-to-end -end length changes with proper wrapping, um, and that would give us also the tendon length change. But in this case, we just wanted a general idea of how the muscles were, were changing length. So obviously it opens and closes its jaw and chews. You get a better idea, though, from this ventral view about the long axis rotation of those heavy mammals. So it's, it's somewhat subtle, but they are rotating relative to each other. Uh, uh, well, yeah, they are rotating um, with each chewing stroke. And it's perhaps most clear, actually, in a dorsal view, because you can see the coronoid processes through the orbits there. You can actually see with the shading, you can see the way that those uh, those heavy mandibles are rotating. So we expected that there would be some long axis rotation as the teeth came into occlusion, as I said, to sort of fine tune that occlusion. But there was a surprise. So let's look at this. So first of all, looking at the graph here, um, the black graph is just opening and closing of the jaw. So this flat part is the grinding stroke. So as it comes up, the jaws are coming together, and then you have a flat uh, just jaw rotation as the, um, during the grinding, and then it opens. So that's just the, the, the uh, depression elevation degree of freedom shown there in black. What's shown in the multicolor is that long axis rotation of the two heavy mammals. And what you see, um, so it's, it's color-coded by eversion and inversion. And what you see as um, the teeth are coming together toward the beginning of that grinding stroke, you get inversion. So as the teeth are coming together, you get inversion, bringing the teeth into precise occlusion. So I'll just, I'll exaggerate it with my elbows, but that would be like this. But the unexpected thing was during the grinding stroke itself, they do this little wiggle. So they come up, they come into occlusion, but then they do that. So it's, we call it a, a rotational grinding stroke, a kind of unexpected extra rotation during the grinding. And so if you look down at the, at the diagram on the lower left, you can see it mapped onto a tooth there. You can see the, um, the inversion, eversion, inversion. And then the middle, very colorful diagram shows kind of what you would um, expect color coding for that. The way you think about the lower jaw coming up and interacting with the tooth on the, the upper jaw. Um, but it's actually easier to see what's going on if we put our frame of reference on the lower jaw and pretend that the upper jaw is going up and down. I mean, it is, it's, it's all frame of reference, right? Um, and so that's what the pictures on your right are showing is, uh, that we can see how the, um, how the upper tooth, the, the protocone of the upper tooth, is interacting with the telonid basin of that lower tooth during this rotational grinding stroke. So I'll show you a movie that shows that with these particle tracers left behind, color-coded for inversion and eversion, so you can see the way that this little rotational grinding stroke is occurring during the chewing stroke. So the procone is on the upper tooth, and then the telonid basin, which is a distinctive mammalian feature at a certain level of evolution, um, that's where we think that this rotational grinding stroke is appearing, is when that telonid basin is um, evolving in the, um, in the evolution of mammals. So here we're really taking advantage of 
what I think is the real power of model-based motion analysis is to really have the shape and the motion together at the same time and um, be able to uh, understand how they interact with each other, kinematics and shape. Um, and this is also, it's also a fun, another fun application because we call this tooth occlusion. Right? When teeth come together in chewing, we call it tooth occlusion, which means by definition, you're not going to see it with external views. You need x-ray because the teeth are occluding each other. And so it, you need something like this particle tracing to show the way that the, um, that the teeth are interacting and the way that the, that procone is interacting with that telonic base. And then, even more fun, as far as I'm concerned, is we can put it together with the fossils. So, teeth have a fantastic fossil record. They fossilize beautifully. So, we, most of what we know about the evolution of mammals is that the fossil history is all in teeth. And, um, and so, we can, we can start to map these things onto an evolutionary tree and look at the coevolution of teeth and jaws and kinematics. So, um, starting at the base of the tree, uh, what we think is happening um, there is um, we begin to see the, um, the evolution of a precise yeah, occlusion like based on seeing how the teeth fit together. Yeah, and we fine. think that there's that um, inversion or occlusion. So we think that they don't do that rotational grinding I mean, stroke, but they can, did evolve the ability to do that inversion to help the teeth align well, um, depending on the movements between them. And then, um, moving along the tree there, um, we think that the rotational grinding stroke okay. evolved um, at the same time as uh, that little articular process. So if you look at the pictures of the backs of the jaws there, there's a, there's a little magenta circle. That's an extra process that evolves at that level at the same time I mean, as the tribosphenic molar. Yeah. Um, and so the little, uh, so you see the magenta circle and then you see the little magenta arrow. That's pointing to that um, Talonid basin, which is uh, what we think is correlated with this, the evolution of this rotational grinding stroke. And so we can actually start to find bony correlates uh, that can help us understand the evolution and gradual acquisition of the full mammalian chewing stroke. And so that's what we see in our opossum. We see that we see a retroarticular process that has muscles that help do this little wiggle, um, and we see the, the telonid base. And then finally, in a bunch of mammals, including ourselves and pigs, we fuse up the lower jaw. We actually make the teeth less complex. They fit together a little less precisely when you have food between them, they don't fit together that precisely, so that we can do this yaw-based grinding. So we no longer do the, the two halves of the jaw wiggling, we do a yaw-based grinding. Um, and uh, that's what we also, that's what we showed in the pigs and has been seen in, in humans. Um, so I think there's a potential, um, application for this in, in human health. So dental cone beam CT scanners are becoming more common, particularly in orthodontics and craniofacial surgery. So um, if you've ever had your teeth not occlude just right, it's really uncomfortable. So if you even just have, um, if you're eating potato chips and you get like a little bit packed down in your molar and then you're biting, it's so uncomfortable because your teeth aren't fitting together right. Or if you have dental work done and it's not quite right and your teeth don't fit together quite right, it takes a long time to get used to the new occlusion, the new bite. Um, and there's some people who have quite dramatic malocclusion, or more than quite dramatic malocclusion, and need to have their jaws modified to make the upper and lower arcs fit together better. And I can imagine, and this, no one does this as far as I know at this time, I can imagine a great application of model-based motion analysis for this. Um, so, um, this uh, dental CT, cone beam CT scanner, um, what happens is the, that thing spins around the head of the patient. So there's the, the x-ray source to your right and the, and the detector plate to your left. So that spins around to make a CT scan. If you just put a second pair of those on that gantry, you have biplanar fluoroscopy. And so you could, you could have the, so you could do the CT scan and then have the subject take that bite plate out um, and uh, 
So you wouldn't use the byte links. You'd want to see the occlusion. But anyway, well, you might. Um, and then um, do fluoroscopy, and then um, do the model-based motion analysis to really see how the teeth are occluding before and after whatever corrective measures are taken. Um, so I think this would be a, a fun clinical application, potential clinical, useful clinical application, not just research application of model-based motion analysis. So I said I'd talk about both opportunities and limitations. So far I've been focusing on mainly on opportunities and one particular opportunity is this idea that you have skeletal shape and motion together. I think that's a particular opportunity, not just six degree of freedom kinematics, which are great, I mean that's useful for a lot of things, but the fact that you have shape and motion together is very powerful. Another thing that's very powerful is adding other uh, sources of data, such as force, pressure, EMG, external motion capture, I'm sure you can think of more, um, really enriches the way that the, um, the XROM data can be used. Limitations. The main one is XROM remains a hugely time consuming process. Even with markers, compared to external mocap, um, XROM, it takes a lot of time. And you have to get everything just right. Um, I was thinking we should have a, sometime a, a big user group meeting where we all give all the different ways we've had data sets fail. <laughs> the things we've done that have made data sets fail. Um, because there's so many parts that go in, your distortion correction, your calibration, your, the synchronization of your images. Um, there's just so much that can go wrong in that chain. So, um, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's time consuming and exacting, for sure. Um, and so sample sizes are likely to remain small for the foreseeable future. And especially if you're not, if you're doing markerless and um, you have the 2D, 3D to 2D registration stuff. Um, that remains very challenging. And so sample sizes are likely to remain small for the foreseeable future. So um, I would say that XROM offers powerful opportunities, but also substantial limitations that need to be considered in study design. Um, if you don't have to do model-based motion analysis XROM to answer the questions that you want to answer, <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> as much as we, it's gotten me a lot easier, but it's still hard. So, you know, think hard about, and also whether, if you, whether you'll actually be able to answer the question. If you're looking at something fairly subtle, it just may not be accessible by these methods at this time, because you would need too much, too large a sample size, given how variable both humans and animals are. Animals are incredibly individually variable, so, um, yeah, same as humans. I show myself as 26 minutes in, um, which uh, I think gives me a chance to do a little bonus, bonus example. Um, I'll do my, my acknowledgments first. Um, funding agencies, some of the, the programmers, Kia Huffman and Ben Torland, who've been fabulous um, software engineers on our project, and my colleagues at Brown in ecology and evolutionary biology, and also in the orthopedics group there. Um, we've had tremendous success. Um, working on XROM together for both human applications and zoological applications. And that's been, been a wonderful, wonderful collaboration. Countless students and postdocs, this is just a subset, I think it's three slides worth at this point of all these people who have contributed. So a bonus example, pretty fun. Dinosaur footprints, not my work, the work of uh, Peter Falkingham and Steve Gatesy. Um, and the thing that's so cool about dinosaur footprints, especially these ones that are made in soft substrates, so this is, a, you, this is a footprint where you're looking at the surface where the foot's penetrated down into the surface. And they can actually CT scan or section it and be able to see all the way the foot is moving inside that fossil. It's a three-dimensional fossil. It's the result of the foot anatomy, the foot motion, and the substrate properties. So it's, a, it's produced by an interaction of those things. And of course, we don't know for sure ever which species makes these, right? Like the trackways, it's not like the animal runs along its trackway and then dies at the end and you know for sure which it is, right? It's, it, you know, there's a certain amount of guesswork in trying to match up the foot anatomy that we have from fossils with these. And so that's part of what this is about, is knowing which, who's the track maker in these, in these, um, 
these soft trackways. So my colleagues uh, Peter Falkenham and Steve Daisy have been using guinea fowl as a model. So of course birds are dinosaurs, there are living dinosaurs, their feet are remarkably similar to dinosaurs, not avian dinosaurs. And so you can see the, the x-ray image at the top, or x-rom, um, this is a, a, just a standard light view, but where they've also calibrated so they can have the bones um, visible at the same time. What this animal is running through is actually uh, poppy seeds. Um, pop, we call, they call it poppy mud. They mix it up also with water and things to have different hydration. So, um, so they're using poppy seeds. And the reason is that actual soils are too radiopaque. Right? So it's radiolucent. And so you can actually see into the material and see the way, like in the upper right, you can see the foot is penetrated into the material there and actually in the lower right too. Um, so they, get the, they, have, they have the foot morphology, they have the foot motion in these. And then they use that on the left in a simulation of the particle motions. So, of course, it's way slowed down as usual. These, these behaviors are very fast. There's the scary glove encouraging the bird along. So it leaves behind the trackway that we can look at the surface of and see um, how it compares to the fossils. And then with the particle simulation, um, we can know, including all the depth of how that fossil is made. So they can match up quite well the, the final model and the foot morphology with these, with these three dimensional. Well, 
about you and the images. I was just curious about the yeah. precision. Thank you. Yeah, what, what do you know about the precision of the optical system? I know that I read papers about it, but I don't know numbers. Okay. Yeah, right is now, it, but we can yeah. talk about it later. Yeah, so, um, so our translational precision is down around 50 microns. Um, so it's, it's, it's good enough to really see. Um, actually, the limitation is more the CT scan because of the partial volume effect. You don't know for sure where the actual edge of the tooth is. And so, and so we typically actually get a little tiny bit of interpenetration um, that shouldn't be there, but, but because the teeth are a little bigger. Um, and so, yeah, just a, 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 um, I'd be interested to, to know. And uh, yes, for clinical purposes, it does seem like just the tooth surface would be sufficient. But potentially for research, yeah. Thank you. So while there's a think about your question, I have one for you. In terms of being able to reproduce the motion of, of these animals and using bead-based kinematics, like what type of how big or how small do the beads have to be in order for you to be able to measure them accurately and see them in fluoro? Yeah, so it, it depends on your system, the magnification, the camera. Um, in our our system with the 42 centimeter image intensifiers on mag zero, we are just able to resolve the 0.5 millimeter of channel spheres. Um, we do better at mag one and mag two, um, and uh, I think there's been some work done on bats, flying bats. Five millimeter in mag three, two or three, and uh, so that that works. So, yeah. We have a question. Can I just give you the microphone? It's on. Yeah. Um, Jordan, the United University of Calgary. From an evolutionary perspective, is there a benefit to the yaw-based chewing as opposed to the two independent mandible components? That's a great question. Um, I actually hadn't really thought about that transition that much. Um, I would think that there must be. So all the animals that have the um, that, that have these sort of pointy molars um, and the potential loose symphysis tend to be insectivores or even carnivores, and they don't chew that much. The animals that chew a lot, omnivores and especially herbivores, they tend to have these bunodont, flatter teeth and this yaw-based motion. And so, um, you know, we don't think that chewing takes a lot of metabolic energy, but um, we do know that ruminants will, will chew like 10,000 cycles in a night. Um, and so, I think it may be that um, there, you know, by simplifying the system, there could conceivably be some energetic um, advantages as well as just in, what you really need is not the precise occlusion, but more of a mortar and pestle grinding. Um, it just makes sense to fuse it up. But then some don't, like goats have, they still have an unfused synthesis, even though they're really omnivores and they eat anything. Um, so yeah, it's interesting mixes. Along those lines, is Change is that yeah. actively controlled, or is it kind of a function of the you know, like pressing and the tooth shape kind of makes them do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Could that be passive as the teeth come together? Um, we don't think so. Uh, based on um, the, uh, yeah, just looking at it, it doesn't look like the the contact is such that it would produce that that rotation. Um, Inversion. It's an eversion. So if anything, it's it's like pushing the lower tooth against the upper tooth rather than it going the other way. Um, and also, uh, the we do see um, shortening of our simulated muscle fibers that's consistent with EMG recordings of that part of the uh, masticatory stroke for these animals. So uh, we think it's active. University of Calgary. Uh, thank you very much for a really lovely talk. Um, considering all the challenges and all the difficulties of running these systems, where do you see some of the future kind of directions in terms of some of the troubleshooting around this and kind of making this, I guess, a more mainstream uh, research tool? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it's interesting that you say research tool. Um, I'd be interested in uh, maybe in the, later in the panel of the symposium what people's ideas are
are about whether it would ever be um, an actual clinical diagnostic tool. I, I don't see it as of right now, and I don't know that I have, have, other than potentially this dental application, I don't know that I've heard of a really compelling clinical application. Um, but um, certainly for human orthopedic biomechanics, the, the, the huge problem is the 3D to 2D registration. Um, and um, so continuing to work on that, you know, I, 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 I hope there's enough information in the biplanar fluoroscopy actually to do it in many cases. I think it's, it's marginal. Um, for just like an information theory perspective, is there actually enough information to register that 3D to 2D? Um, uh, and then just continuing to streamline the distortion correction and the calibration. There was a nice poster here from, uh, I think, from Janet Brodsky's group with the bundle adjustment calibration. So doing calibration and distortion correction all at the same time, that might help um, streamline things. Did I get that right? The education. Um, and um, so there, yeah, there are a variety of things that might at least take out some of the steps that we currently can get wrong. Um, but yeah, it just it just remains a, a pretty pretty exacting method. So it's a good question. I think we're we're approaching our time here, and I, I just want to leverage that segue. Thank you very much, uh, Gregor, um, because I, I want to make. Uh, my shameless self plug. We have another uh, symposium following as a keynote. I think Glenn 201 202, which will follow in 15 minutes, where we have an additional three speakers that can span the application of biplaning radiography. Um, I also have, before we, we do a final thank you here, I have some notes for the day that I've been instructed to relay to you uh, that all running wearable, all running and wearable running biomechanics sessions of today. Um, that were in McLeod E4 are now moved to Glenn 208, 209, and all prostheses and arthroplasty sessions of today that were originally scheduled in Glenn 208, 209 are moved to room McLeod E4. Um, so thank you again, Beth. Sorry, it's tremendous to see your work um, and the breadth and depth of it and um, your, your dedication to making a lot of this technology uh, shareable and developing it uh, not only in so uh, let's give our speaker uh, a part of thank you.